Thank you so much, Marsha and the missions team. <clears throat> well, how are things going so far? Ah, I see you, I see you. You have to be careful where I say this, this service is recorded, right? But uh, in, nice, nice to see everybody this morning. Looks like everybody's in good, uh, in good health and good uh, spirits, uh, full of the joy of the Lord. Is that true? Yeah. So then, uh, we. This is going to be the last one. Okay, this is going to be the last in the series on Gideon. Uh, we've done seven. I figured, okay, that's enough. Right, that's enough with Gideon. But <coughs> it is uh, actually the second part to what I started last week. We didn't have time to finish last week. Uh, we were talking about the unmaking. The unmaking of uh, Gideon as a, an important spiritual leader in uh, the country of uh, Israel. And uh, kind of looking at what it is that took him down, right? And <coughs> one of the, the things last week, the primary things we talked about was placing people on pedestals. The tendency to worship the clay instrument rather than the God who inspired and empowered that instrument. And that when we do that, it has an impact on the leader and has an impact also on the follower. The impact on the leader is that it infects his mind and his ego to believe that he's something that he's not. That's number one. The impact on the follower is that it now opens up the follower to uh, false teaching and to idol worship. And so basically that's what we, uh, we talked about uh, last week. Uh, but we're, we're not done. Uh, we're going to read the final part of um, Gideon's story. <coughs> and um, so Gideon, as we learn, is not willing to accept to the position of to be king. He, he feels uh, and he knows that to be wrong according to the law of Moses. And so he won't accept um, to be king, which, I mean, he was right not to, to do that. But there is something that he is open to. There's something that he wants to accept. And that's what we'll read here, Judges chapter 8, starting at verse 24. And he said, that's Gideon, said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. <clears throat> they answered, we'll be, glad, we, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings <coughs> uh, he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Oprah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Yes, a snare. And that's why I brought this um, trap here. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to tell you what this is for, okay, but, um, um, well, it's a trap. And everyone knows the cage-looking thing. You know what? Even the animals know this is a trap, <laughs> okay? But the, the key to this and how this works is you have to put a lure or a bait uh, inside there. <clears throat> we put a cracker with um, with peanut butter, okay? So you put the cracker and the peanut butter in there, and the rodent, or whatever it is, uh, really wants the bait. And so they go in there, and they press that little lever, and whoop, okay? So uh, you understand that every rodent in its right mind understands not to go in some weird thing like this. Uh, that's not the question. I think we also understand what traps are <laughs> and that they're no good. Uh, the problem is the bait. And so most of the time, the Bible, when it's talking about, you know, snares 
it's talking about that. It's talking about the bait. And <clears throat> so, uh, yes, I am going to um, talk about a few things, or two, money and worship. Money and worship as being that bait um, this morning. Um, let's start with the snare of money. Snare of money. That thing is so dirty. It's like it's in my backyard. So, <clears throat> 1,700 shekels. That's a that's a measure of of weight. It is turns out to be about 20 kilos of gold. We don't know exactly. Okay, it could be more than that, but it's it's something about 20 um, about 20 kilos. That turns out to be 1.8 million dollars in in the way we evaluate you know, gold today. Well, I checked at the beginning of the week. Okay, so $1.8 million. I just want you to understand that this is not a small amount that Gideon was asking for or that he received. It's a huge amount of money. So did this money have anything to do with Gideon's unmaking? Let's have a poll. <laughs> Those who think that it had a role in his unmaking. Put up your hand. You think that money had to do uh, with, and it wasn't 20 bucks, it was $1.8 million. Did that, that would, did that play a role? And, <clears throat> you know, if you remember the beginning of the story, when we first met uh, Gideon, he was threshing wheat, okay? And, and so manual labor. And it's not like he had servants or whatever doing the manual labor for him. He was doing it himself. So my point is that he was kind of like the average, an average Joe. And so my guess is that people being as they are, um, that there's nothing new under the sun, and money, yes, was part of his unmaking, or uh, the unmaking of Gideon's positive influence, anyways, in, in the country. I, nothing new under the sun, right? There's, there's only a few things that really get people, <coughs> and they're usually always the same thing. Money, sex, power, going to be one of those things, right? So that, that's, that's what happened here. Now, there's clear teaching in the Bible about money and material possessions, and we've talked about those things often uh, in, in this church. And um, our question today <coughs> is how money can affect a leader's influence. So how money can affect or uh, alter a person that has uh, uh, good motives and wants to do something good, wants to make a difference in the lives of people, and yet is somehow altered by money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I want to be careful to emphasize, I was talking with a few people between the service, to emphasize <coughs> the love of money. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with money. If you're rich, whatever rich means uh, this morning, uh, God loves you. Right, come and see me after the church. But, but uh, you know, it's not about money itself that we're talking about. It's the love of money is the root of of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And <clears throat> I'm going to give you the full context of that, um, of that verse a little bit later. For many, I want to give you a personal example. For many years, we believed that leaders, especially spiritual leaders, especially spiritual leaders in the province of Quebec, okay, we believed uh, that they should follow the vow of St. Francis of Assisi. Do you know what the vow of St. Francis of Assisi is? It is the vow of poverty. Okay? So you have to be poor if you are a spiritual leader. And so <clears throat> Francis, St. Francis embraced the poverty because, as he believed, Christ did. He wrote that by becoming human in form, in the form of Jesus... God had made himself poor in our world. That's in his words. So if we are to imitate Jesus Christ in all things, we have to imitate him in his poverty. Right? So the early church 
gave us the first example, or so St. Francis of Assisi thought, okay, and, and that's the way what he taught. He often used this passage to, to underline what it is that he was teaching about poverty. Uh, Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> all believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Okay, so that was kind of to bolster what he was uh, teaching about poverty. So this means that a person who took religious vows to be a Franciscan monk, uh, they owned nothing. They, they had nothing. Rather, their, pro their property was owned by the church. And so this vow of poverty became very popular in the world uh, for centuries, for centuries, and it impacted uh, the Protestant movement as well. And so we were impacted by this um, vow of poverty and what it meant in, in Christianity. And so <clears throat> for, um, for a long time, pastors or the pastor or the minister would always live in the parsonage or uh, some use the word mans okay so it's a property that's owned by the church so the pastor did not own anything uh, it's the church that owned it so <clears throat> that comes from this vow of poverty now ask me how I know this because I personally growing up as a child my parents are going to kind of chuckle here because I grew up in those parsonages Okay, so I grew up in houses that were not owned by my parents. They were owned by the church. So they actually didn't have a house. Uh, they, uh, they lived in the church's house. Okay, so that comes from all of this vow of, of poverty. There are, of course, problems with this, uh, this mentality. <coughs> when a pastor is no longer able to work, uh, he becomes a liability that the church is n often not able to support. So what it leads to is pastors who have served the gospel and the kingdom their whole lives, but who are left to live as beggars in their old age. So, <clears throat> you know, kind of very little income and no place to live. Um, and so in our movement, that is the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, we have decided many years ago that we were not satisfied with treating our spiritual leaders in this way. And so the theology uh, that surrounds all of this uh, starts, I guess, with 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that says this. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered <coughs> on the altar. And this is an Old Testament example, but now the Apostle Paul applies it to today and says that in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now, most people would kind of agree, at least in the concept of what uh, that is, is talking about. The disagreement comes with the definition of what constitutes a living, you know, th that they should make a living from the gospel. A and this is where we really need to go back to biblical principles. And the implications here uh, relate to a lot more than just pastors or people on, on staff of a church, okay? And uh, so from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is teaching, we read the following, and it's a long passage. Is it all right if we read long passages? Yeah, in, in church? Is that, is that okay? Yeah. So Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your, eyes, uh, are, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve 
both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is, <coughs> is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much of mo much more value than they? <coughs> can, uh, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And I'll end it there. So what we get from this passage is do not store up money, do not serve money, and do not worry about money. Okay? If you summarize, it's, there's your three-point sermon if you were looking for that this morning <clears throat> the three of these are connected those who spend their lives storing up money um, that requires a lot of energy and effort to store up money um, you know you got to watch the market you got to be looking for tax breaks you got to be identifying good and bad investments etc 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 you know what i'm talking about it's very time consuming energy consuming <clears throat> and then after spending so many years serving the purpose of accumulating money um, they finish their lives worrying about losing it so they're all connected in 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 some ways more to my point this morning there's something about the focus on storing and serving and worrying about money that works against our ability to have a healthy spiritual influence on other people's lives. There's something in that that works against our ability to have influence in people's lives. And now is when I want to read you the whole context of 1 Timothy chapter 6. All right? Uh, and so here he starts like this. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. Here he's talking about, and you need to read the whole book to understand the, the true context of what I'm talking about. But he's talking about how to have a spiritual influence in a person's life. And, and what kind of person you need to be and what you need to be focusing on. And so it's having an influence, a spiritual influence on a person's life. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are, and here's where it starts, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Oh, there it is. <laughs> There's the financial gain part that's somehow worked its way into the discipleship <laughs> that we were trying to do with people, right? Financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love, and this is where we read before, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so I asked this question to my staff early this week. Um, uh, and we had a little conversation about it. <clears throat> the question is, how can godliness be a means of financial gain? Because that's like a central part of this whole passage, right? That, that wait a minute, I, are you say, are you're saying that godliness can, can be a way to, you know, to get financial uh, gain. Well, that's what he's saying. Um, <clears throat> it starts with being conceited. In other words, having an illusion about yourself, believing that you are something that you are not, that you actually deserve the accolades. You deserve uh, for people to thank you because of something 
that you uh, that you did. You didn't actually do it. It was God that did it, but you happened to be there, you know, innocent bystander. God used you in some way. And, and now uh, people are looking for some way to thank God. They're so thankful, and you end up being the person they're thanking. We think we deserve that. That's what it means when the Apostle Paul says that they are conceited. Okay, so the next step after that comes the temptation to profit from that position of influence in people's lives, to profit from that influence. So in the case of Gideon, <coughs> who or what gave him the right to receive $1.8 million from, from the people that God delivered? What gave him the right to accept that as a thanks for what God had done in their lives? Um, I, I suppose it's normal to receive gifts of thanks for something that was done in the name of the Lord. I think that it's healthy. You know, people want to say thanks and you receive thanks. But <clears throat> it's quite another thing to be looking for, to be expecting the satisfaction that comes from those gifts. Satisfaction should come from the Lord, not from the gifts that we receive from, from people, the thanks that we, we receive from, from people. So <clears throat> how does that apply? Well, first of all, for, my, for myself, and my situation may be different from, from yours, so I, I'm going to give a general application in just, in just a second. But for myself, I own a house. Well, own a house. I don't actually own the house yet. The bank, own, well, it still belongs to mostly anyway to the bank. But, but I have a house. I live in it. I, I'm paying for it. And, and so, uh, by the way, my, my dad bought a house uh, later in life. And uh, so he was able to have a house as well. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I don't believe that I, being uh, you know, a pastor in a church, um, being supported by the church, I don't believe that I should be paid any more than an average salary in this church. Average. Okay, so there's some that, that have... Uh, that get paid way more than I do, and there's some that are paid much less. Okay, so I, uh, I probably receive a salary that is kind of average for our congregation. So I strongly believe in that. Now, the board, I don't decide my own salary. The, the board does. And, uh, you know, of course, there's things to, to look at. <coughs> uh, first and foremost, our, our finances and so on, and we have a staff of 10. But what I believe is that I should be getting a salary uh, that is average for us, for our, our congregation. Thirdly, and this often does not get said, uh, that uh, I also give tithes back to the Lord. I give 10% of what I receive back to the church. Do you, did you realize that? Did you, you, you know that that's the case, right? So I, I wouldn't be up here teaching and encouraging this kind of behavior this kind, uh, you know, in believing that this is the right thing to do according to Scripture and then not do it myself. That, that's ridiculous. Okay, so no, I, I support the church in the same way that you do. If you are a member of, the church, uh, of this church, we encourage uh, uh, regular giving, right, to, to the church. And so <clears throat> that's also uh, the case for, for me. Now for a general application, <coughs> Luke chapter 6. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend, lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. This is where it goes kind of opposite, right, what Christians do. Okay, so <coughs> love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back, which I guess is not lending. It's more like giving, <laughs> okay? So without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. In other words, 
uh, not uh, giving back to them what they deserve, right? That's to be merciful. So matter, no matter what you do to other people, how you do ministry in people's lives and how you contribute it to their lives, don't fall into the snare of expecting personal benefit from what you have done. Some people have fallen into the snare of measuring how, uh, uh, measuring how uh, the quality of what God has done in a person's life by the return that they have received from it. That's not the way it works, right? Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, not from people, from the Lord. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I'm going to end it there and go on to the next snare. The next snare, uh, <clears throat> which I will finish with today, is the snare of worship. Uh, the passage says that Gideon made an ephod with some of the gold he had received. Now, you remember it's 20 kilos. Uh, I don't know how an ephod is a garment. Okay, it's a, it's a garment that the priests wore. And you can read about it. The law of Moses clearly, des clearly describes in detail how the ephod was to be um, uh, made. <coughs> I'm quite sure that you can't put... 20 kilos of gold into a garment. That would be a garment, right? <laughs> I really don't think so. But anyways, he used some of it and he made this ephod. And we think that because it was a holy thing, that it was used for worship, that um, it was kind of, this money was used for a good cause. Right? It was, it was something for the glory of God. And so because we spent money for the glory of God, then it's all good, right? It says here that the people ended up worshiping that ephod. Worshiping it. And what sounds funny to me, is it seems like there wasn't even a priest wearing that ephod. It kind of just stood there. Maybe in a case, like in a museum or something, there was a stand, and here's this, this ephod, kind of empty, uh, and, and people would come and to, I don't know, pay their respects to it, to worship it, to, I, I don't know what the, exactly they were doing to it, but, but there it stood. Um, so often this is the case. The outward form becomes more important than the inward form. Reality, the form of it. Holy things rather than holiness. You following me? Holy things become more important than holiness. This is what the, the first two commandments are about. No other gods and no idols. But holy things rather than holiness. Can you think of some holy things? Think of some holy things that you know, you know, you know of, maybe in the Bible or <clears throat> in, uh, in our surroundings. There's so many of them. How about one example from the Bible? Remember the, the brass serpent? The, serp the serpent, remember the, the story of how uh, Moses put this serpent up on uh, uh, a pole or a cross or whatever it was, and, and the people of Israel passed by, and as soon as they looked at the serpent, uh, they were healed. Well, you know that that brass serpent, uh, they kept. They kept it. It became a holy thing. Do you know that the people of Israel worshipped that thing for like 800 years? 800 years before somebody, somebody had the good sense to destroy the thing and get rid of it. Okay, but 800 years. They, okay, so, but we have... So many other examples. I mean, all over the world, uh, we have church buildings. There's a, a few church buildings that I visited in Vatican. Uh, pretty, pretty nice. Okay, but there's a cornerstone there that says, to the glory of God, right? Well, it's for, it's for God. It's for the glory of God. So it's, it's okay, right? Statues, 
bones, relics. Anyone ever been to the St. Joseph's Oratory, the crutches there? Isn't that kind of like a holy thing? A holy thing, right? The way we dress, communion plates, I don't know, Christian language, even worship, worship songs. Somehow, I think that some of Michael W. Smith's, Smith's songs are, are going to be, uh, you know, when I walk into heaven. I want, I want to hear some of those. I want to see Michael there singing. Okay, but we have a tendency to even worship music to make that into a holy thing. John chapter 4. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So this speaks of the inward, the unseen nature of God. And this is the way that he should be worshipped. Now, we have a hard time with that. We have a hard time with the unseen. You know, it seems to me it would be a lot easier if Jesus were right here in front of us. You know, and we worship Jesus, right? Him, you know, one day it will be the case. Amen. Jesus will be in front of us, and we will worship him in person. But you realize that it's Jesus who said this in John chapter 4? That's Jesus' words. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So when we worship in the spirit or by the spirit and in truth, we are acknowledging the truth about who God is, and that is of the spirit, right? It's the spirit of God that allows us to do that and to see that and to know that. Okay, so we acknowledge the truth about who God really is according to scriptures and not worshiping, therefore, our own creation our, or, or our own interpretation of who we think God should be. No, it's the truth about who God is, his characteristics, his person. That's who we are worshiping. That's why it says in the spirit and in truth. Because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that knowledge, knowledge of the scriptures to know who he is. An ephod is a garment to be worn by a priest. I mentioned that before. It's just an empty garment without the priest. <clears throat> Worship is the same. Worship is nothing on its own. Just the empty, I guess if you're calling worship music, it's just music, right? Uh, it's the content that's important. And that content is you. The content is you. We are the worshipers. When you make Jesus Lord of your life, Lord over your life, you become a worshiper, right? Romans chapter 12, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Your true and proper worship. So there you have it. That was the story of, of Gideon, his making and his unmaking. <clears throat> And so as we launch out to do the works of God in the world, go in the strength that you have. Look around, see what's there. Take your life into your own hands and start doing something. Go in the strength that you have. Secondly, be victorious by the power that comes from the Lord, not from ourselves. God that will win the battle. It's God that will have victory, right? So be victorious by the power that comes from the Lord. And thirdly, remember that Jesus must continue to be Lord of all. Lord of all. So is, is Jesus Lord of your life? I don't know. I, somehow I think we, re we sang this song at some point. I forget when, but Jesus be... The Lord of all, Jesus be 
the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all, the kingdoms of my life. Is he Lord of your life? Lord of everything. This is the key, right, of, of everything. We want to have an influence for God in our surroundings, in, a, in our lives. But he needs to be Lord of everything, of all. He is my shield. We talked about worship being the characteristics. This is repeating the characteristics of who God is. He is my shield. He is my fortress. He is my hiding place. He's the keeper of my soul. He's the lifter of my head. All of this is from scripture. He is my fortress, my refuge. He is my rock. He is my shade and my shelter. He is my healer. My sickness disappears. He is my conqueror. Defeat is not possibility anymore. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is my shepherd. He restores my soul. He is the author of my salvation. The Lord of the Lord my righteousness. He's my deliverer. He's my advocate. He's the ancient of days. He's the great high priest. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning. He doesn't just begin things. He ends them. He began a good work in you, and he will faithfully complete it. He is the covenant maker. He is the covenant keeper. He's the creator. He is the sustainer. Are you getting my point? Jesus, sing it together. Be the Lord of all. Let's stand together. Jesus, be the Lord of all. Jesus, be the Lord of all the kingdoms of my life. One more time. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of my life, Jesus, Jesus, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Lord, we want to have an impact for you. We don't just want to come here Sunday after Sunday, same old, same old, listening to words. Lord, we want these words to be real, to have power. Lord, we want to have an influence for you. We want to see lives changed and healed. We want to see people completely turned around. And this is your work. And we can be part of it. Mighty warriors. We can be part of what you're doing, Lord. But Lord, I pray that you would remind us of who we are and who you are. Lord, we determine to make you Lord of every part of our lives and to see you through us do great things. Lord, we thank you. We worship you, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. Debbie has a few announcements.